Well, welcome everyone to the Sabbath service today. Um, today is the second Sabbath of the 10th month, and it's going to be an exciting message for me and for you, uh, because um, every time we read the Bible, it's exciting. Um, it was just an interesting morning this morning, and last night, and this, this whole week, and this whole month, and this whole year for that matter, it was it's been an interesting time because um, God's doing some amazing things right now around the world. It's been pretty unbelievable um, the stuff that he's doing, the stuff that we can see online, the things that um, he's revealed through the scriptures. And, you know, today it's going to be probably a basic message for some of us. Um, for some of us, it may be, you know, brand new. And for some of you watching that, you know, never been here before, you know, this might be the first time you've even understood this information. But... Um, God wants you to know it. So I said, okay, God, I don't know what you're doing through this message, but let's go for it. So we're going to go through a message today, and I'm going to pass this out. And we'll take a look at that. And it says here, and by the way, everyone uh, in our ministry, you've already had this email to you. Um, and it's, the message is called, The Lord Gives Us Sacred Times, Days, and Years. And it's talking about the Lord's calendar. Amen. Now, why is that important? Because... Um, God has set his calendar um, at the beginning of time um, for a reason, for us to be able to, to be on his calendar and his schedule and his plan. Um, but, you know, over the years, things have changed and things got off of that. And, you know, it's been an interesting time. So we're going to go through um, a little bit about the scriptures and how it works so you can understand it from a basic level. And then I don't know where God's going to go with it because I always look at the scriptures and they seem basic. And then God just revealed all kinds of other stuff through it. So let's go and talk about the first things. It has a couple questions on here. The first question is, what are the sacred times? What do they actually mean, actually mean in Scripture? Um, who are they for? And, you know, what should we do about it? And, you know, what are the signs of the Lord? So that's what we're going to go through today. So let's go ahead and look at some Scripture. And the first, we're going to go back to the, be the beginning. And, you know, as we're going back to the beginning, I kind of want to share, you know, just a little bit real quick and be a little vulnerable with you guys. This, um... This year has been an interesting year for our family, and this month, in the last few months since the Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles, has been probably the most challenging um, months I've ever witnessed financially for my family. Uh, it's been, and, and I didn't know why. I didn't know what was the reason why, because I've been pouring my heart out for God and doing all these things for God, and kind of like Jesus poured his heart out for him, and then he was nailed to a cross, and he's like, why are you forsake me? That's kind of how Jesus felt, but God didn't forsake him. He was doing something greater than Jesus even understood at the time he was on that cross. You know, he was doing something magnificent. And I could see how, you know, I kind of have to look back at that, have to look at my life and say, God, why, is, why are we going through the challenges we're going through at this time? Why? And so it, it's, um, the re, you know, I, I look at it, the, the good is that something great's going to come out of it. And it was a thing I said the other day to Jamie, and I'm, I'm going to have to do a video on this one day. He's... It's, it's kind of like, like, I felt like I was up against the wall. You know, when you, you push so far and you're up against the wall, and, you know, I was just putting this analogy out there. You know, when you're up against the wall, that's when you can actually have a breakthrough to the wall, through the wall. See, if you're not near the wall, you can't really have a breakthrough near the wall. And not being near the wall means you're comfortable. Life is just easy. It's just flowing, like, natural and comfortable. And I can look back at my life in multiple times, pivotal times in my life, all the way back to when I was young, when life was just comfortable and easy, then, then nothing big was happening. But as soon as God allowed me to get to the wall, then I had a breakthrough, and I persevered through it, and then something magnificent happened. Every single time. And that exact same thing is about to happen now, because God just um, helped me break through some things in my mindset and my thought process, even about my job, like Jamie was talking about. I realize I'm a, um, I, I've been a, a, a donkey um, in a uh, race, at, at a car race on the Indy 500, <laughs> trying to race with those people. It's a long story, but bottom line is, in my business, I was doing things the donkey way, in a, in a very slow, old school way, and I learned that I had to repent and get up to date and up to speed. Up to speed. And so I realized that. And so because of that, things had to change, and because of that, in this last couple of weeks, God's changing some things in a big way. And it's going to really do some magnificent things for the body of Christ. So I'm excited about that. So God put this message on my heart. And, and um, let's go through Genesis 1. We're going to go back to the beginning. 
Genesis 1, we're going to start in verse 14. Genesis 1, 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times, days, and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. God, them, God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. So there's a couple of things I want you to notice, and on your paper there's a blank line there, and it says, the sacred times were for something. And I'm going to tell you what the sacred times were for. They're actually for God's people. The sacred times are for the people of God. And so it's very important to understand that. Now, at that time, there was no people of God. <laughs> but, you know, he didn't know people, well, I guess he probably did know people were going to defect and go a different direction. That's why he had a plan. But bottom line is, it was, it's for his people. And it says the sacred times marks a few things. One, they serve as signs. You got to understand what a sign is. So we're going to look at some signs today in the scriptures because the Bible always talks about signs. So the first of all, the, 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 the lights in the sky, which are the sun, moon, and stars, they mark sacred times. So we need to understand what those are. We also know that the sun, moon, and stars are for signs. They're a, they're a, a, a sign in the sky for a reason, it's like a signal. And it says it marks the sacred times, the days, and the years. So if you think about a sacred time today, you know, we, there's a holiday coming up that the world celebrates on the 25th called Christmas. Um, it has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus in the Bible, but people believe it do. It does, but, and that's okay. But, you know, the, the bottom line is this. That's a sacred time to the world. And there's a lot of other sacred times right now going on that the world celebrates. But the Bible says that the sun, moon, and stars are what marks the sacred times. It's not a day of the month. It's not, not buying groceries and Christmas gifts and all kinds. It's not that that marks the sacred times. What marks the sacred times, the Bible says, is the sun, moon, and stars. And so it's very important to understand that, especially if you're just coming into this knowledge. You need to understand. That's why we recommended you go out to look at the moon tonight. Because you're going to see that sacred moon is a, is a sacred... Um, it's a moon that, it's a full moon. So you can now know what it looks like on the 14th day of every month. You want to get in the habit of looking at the, the, the sun, moon, and stars. You want to make that a habit. The word moon, just so you know, it is in Hebrew, means Rosh Kadesh. You can look that up for yourself. And it literally means head or the renewal, thus the be head or the beginning of the month. So just so you understand, a new moon means a new month. In Hebrew, that being a new you know, moon, month, means the same thing. So it's very important to understand that. So the beginning of every month is, is what's called a new moon. Okay, and then you count seven days and, and then another seven days, and that's how you got to the 14th day today. The reason why that was brought up, and God brought this up to me today, because some people were asking me, well, what do you mean the 10th month and then the first month and then January is coming up? And how does that all tie together? Well, in the Bible, there is no January, February, March, April, May. If you do the, look up the origin of it, those are pagan, God's names. And God didn't have any of those in the Bible. God had Jan um, the first month, the seventh month, the third month. And you're going to see that in Scripture today. So it's very important to understand this biblical foundation. God wants us to get back to the biblical foundation because in two months, we're going to be back at the first month. And so God wants you to understand this for yourself, not just because we text you a message letting you know it's the you know, second day of the first month. It's your obligation to know God's calendar. It's your obligation. Okay, so let's keep going. So let's look at some other scriptures about the different sacred times in the Bible. So you can see how they come together, and then you'll see how they're tied together with Jesus. Okay, so let's look at um, Exodus. Exodus 12. Now, you guys all know the story of, of Moses when he went to go free his, the slaves and the Israelites in Egypt. Um, God sent them there and went to, went to the Pharaoh and 
they had all the ten plagues, right? So they had different plagues out there, and and it was like, what were all the different plagues, Maddox and, and Jaden? What were the plagues? It was like flies and what else? Hail, Hail and there were nighttime. nighttime darkness, and there was water locusts. Blood. Yeah, the water turned to blood, and, and there was the firstborn. the firstborn died, and frogs. there was frogs and locusts. Locusts, yep. Yeah. And there was some. There was a couple other ones, wasn't there? It, there was like ten of them. There was a whole bunch of different plagues. But the bottom line is, those different plagues were there for a reason. Because God was humbling the people that were enslaving his people, the Israelites. Now, the Israelites were right there in Egypt with them, but they weren't suffering any of this stuff. God had protected his people. So, right in the same city, the people were getting hammered with all these different things, plagues, boils, and all kinds of stuff. And over here, his people were protected. And they weren't all bundled together. Guess what? They were separate. They were in different houses. They were in different areas. But in their area, they were protected. And I believe that same thing's happening today. Um, because I know our family's being protected. And over in Florida, you got Lila and, and Philip, they're protected. And, and Deborah's where they are. And Mama T and those, those guys are where they are. Our guys and brothers and sisters in India, it's, it's really encouraging. One of them called me yesterday and said, man, there's a, there's a typhoon happening out here in India. And I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. I said, don't worry. He goes, well, I'm not. We're, we're good. And our area is fine. And Mano's area is fine. And Ra's area is fine. We've talked to all, of, all the brothers. They're fine. There's nothing happening in their area. I was like, I know, because God protects his people <laughs> that are keeping his commandments. So there wasn't any concern, because the Bible says in the last days God protects his people. But those, those plagues are happening. So we're going to look at, we're going to read just a little bit so you can understand the different sacred times. So you can establish that foundation. So let's start reading of the, of verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be you the first month, the first month of your year. Very first thing you got to understand is that in this particular month, this is the first month of your year. You notice that? It's not the first month of the year. It's the first month of his people's year. That's very important for you. Because you are God's people. If you're honoring his commandments, you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you're part of the body of Christ. If that's the case, you are his people, and this is the first month of your year. Very important. Now, there's, other, there's probably other people had years back then, because there were other people in the world. This wasn't the first month of the Egyptians' years. This wasn't the first month of the Canaanites' years. It wasn't the first month of the Jebusites years or all the other Hittites and uh, Ites peoples that were at that time. All those other people, they had probably different calendars and years and the Mayan calendar and all kinds of stuff going on, right? But we're God's people. And on God's people, God's on his, we're on his calendar. And this says this is the first month of your year. So we got to establish that for ourselves individually that this is when our year begins. Now, we have to live in this world, so we have to go by some of the things of this calendar, but I base my life on God's calendar. So this is of the first month of your year. Keep reading. <clears throat> Tell the whole community of Israel, on the 10th day of this month, a man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If a household is too small for the lamb, they must share it with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance to what a person will eat. Here's the key. The animal you choose must be a year-old male without defect. Write that down. Because that will come to play later on down the road. But a year-old male lamb without defect. In other words, perfect. I'm just going to throw it out there right now. Jesus in the future will become that one-year-old lamb that was perfect, that was slain on Passover. Got to understand that. I'm just sharing that in advance because we're not going to go through that whole study. But you need to understand, Jesus is that sacrificial lamb that was happening here. Okay? So they had to take this perfect lamb. Now, the reason why it says one year, because we were told Jesus preached for three years. He really didn't even preach for one full year. He preached for a few months or a few weeks or so, and then he got killed. <laughs> so that's a lie also. But he was one year old. It was in that first year. That's why it's only a one-year-old lamb, okay? We'll do another study on that later. But let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 6. Take care of them until the 14th day of the first month, when all the members of the community of Israel must be slaughtered at twilight. 
14th day of any of God's month is always when there's a full moon. Today is the 14th day of the 10th month. And if you go outside tonight, there'll be a full moon, meaning on the day Jesus was slain, there was a full moon. Remember the moon turned to darkness, turned to blood, or, or went dark? It's because it was a full moon. Very important. Okay? Got it. So let's keep going. It says, verse 7, then, take, uh, then, uh, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lamb. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with the head and legs of the internal organs. Do not eat any of them till morning. If someone's left till morning, it, um, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your clothes tucked in your belt and your sandals on your feet and a staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. Q, Q, a few key points there. One is that you don't have to eat this meat with the internal organs. I, I'm sorry, I just don't eat cow guts nowadays. They may have eaten it differently back then, but I choose not to do that right now. So you don't have to prepare the meal this exact way. I just want to Throw that out there, just in case you're thinking, well, I gotta cut this meat up like that. No, you don't have to do all that. But this is a, 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 a day that we honor, and we do serve the Lord's Passover on that day. And we want to honor that day as Passover, okay? Because it's the Lord's Passover, and the Lord is Jesus. He just had not become flesh at that point. Very important. Let's keep reading. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. So just understand, Passover was a judgment call. He was going to pass judgment on the people of Egypt. And then it said, the blood will be a sign on you, uh, for you on the house where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So if you notice, there's a separation. Egypt, meaning the sinful world at that time, the other people that were not of God, on that day, it was a sign. And Jesus, when he came and he died on the cross, what did he do? He died. He shed his blood on the cross. He, was, he died on that day. And guess what? That was a sign and a judgment for the world to separate his people. The people that understood his sign, the people that followed his sign, and they got baptized, which you're going to see in a little bit, were saved. You understand? And this is a sign. So you got to understand, God gives us signs to look at. And it all started with the sun, moon, and stars. That's why it was the 14th day of the first month. Very important to understand this. Okay? So it's a sign. Remember the word sign. Right? Make, make a note of that. Sign. I'm looking for signs. <clears throat> see, if you want to drive from one place to another today... It's pretty easy to do. Why? Navigation. We have navigation. Well, yeah, we have navigation. You don't even need a sign nowadays. But the navigation is the sign. It just it reads the signs. See, this sign is telling us go left and right. Imagine having a, a city with no street signs. And your friend tell you to come over to the house. How are you going to get there? You wouldn't know which direction to go. See, and if you're not looking at the signs, you're not going to know which direction to go in life right now either. Very important. If you don't know the signs of the times today, you're not going to know what's going on. So God gave us these signs so we can know direction. <clears throat> Write that down. God gave us signs so we can know direction and what to do. Right? If you want to go grocery shopping and you don't know the names of the stores because there's no sign on the store, you can walk into an underwear store to go buy groceries. You're going to be in the wrong spot. <clears throat> right? You, well, I don't know if there's any underwear stores, but you know what I'm saying. It could be a store that's not for groceries, right? It could be a golf car, a golf course. You might walk into a golf course thinking that's a grocery store. It's not a grocery store because there's no signs. See, a sign gives us direction on where we need to be. And so it's very important. If you don't know the signs, how are you going to watch the signs? So this is very important. Passover is a sign. His death on that cross was a sign. Let's keep reading. This is the day you are to commemorate. Commemorate means get together, honor, 
You honor that day. You commemorate it. For generations to come, you should celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. See, at this time, this was 2,000 years before Jesus even had come. But see, he knew he was coming. So guess what he did? He created a celebration in advance where you can celebrate it every single year. Why? So you can get into the habit of celebrating it. See, if you get in the habit of celebrating it, when he showed up on the scene on that exact day 2,000 years later, you'd say, there's the sign. That's who I was looking for. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus was doing. He trained them this time to honor this sign, to eat the rose, do it at twilight, right before. So, and it's a one-year-old lamb. Jesus came as a one-year-old lamb and died on that exact day, 2,000 years later. You understand? Because he trained them. He was training the people. That's why the ones that were honoring him knew the sign. The ones that were not honoring him, guess what? They didn't believe the signs. And that's why they killed them, because they didn't know. You understand? Very important to understand this. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. On the first day, I hold a sacred assembly. And another on the seventh day. <clears throat> Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. So in this time, their, their feeding and cooking was their, that was what they had to do to rest. They had to not cook and eat. Now, uh, that's not a, 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 a prerequisite for us, but we, we should not work. And it talks about that. But very important, that was their work. But God gave them the ability to work on that day. You know why? Because they wouldn't have been able to prepare for the Passover. So during that day, it was, a, it was a Sabbath, even though it wasn't considered Sabbath at that time, because he hadn't established the Sabbath at that time. But from that point on, every 14th day was always a Sabbath day from this point on. You understand? But we can still do something on that Passover day. So it's very important to understand that that's what that day was. Let's keep reading. Celebrate the festival of leavened bread. That's the next feast day. So it goes Passover first, feast of unleavened bread next. It says, because on this very day, I brought your division out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generation to come. Notice again, it's a lasting ordinance for generation to come. And it didn't get nailed to the cross. It's a lasting ordinance for generations to come. Verse 18, in the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast. From the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast to be found in your houses. Now, that is something that we do. We take out the yeast out of our house. So we go get our bread, we go get our crackers and our cookies. Um, a lot of the time, we just bought them because we forgot. <laughs> then we throw them away. We get them out of the house. And we, the reason why we get them out of the house is because we want to honor this feast. And what we recognize is that yeast in, in, the, in the, what we would call the New Testament when Jesus came... He would call the feast and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the yeast and the um, leaven of the Pharisees is sin. So it's purifying ourselves from sin. This particular feast represents baptism when Jesus died on the cross and was buried. And that's what gets rid of our sin. Very important to understand that. That baptism is what gets rid of our sin. And I do want to mention really quick that I'm so excited uh, for um, our friends that are getting baptized because... Um, they have start studying the Bible. And it was amazing. Alicia, when she started studying the Bible with us the other day, her humility was um, very apparent. Because at first she was thinking that she had the Holy Spirit because she was um, speaking in tongues and she had learned about that years ago. And the Bible revealed to her when you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's at baptism. And without baptism, you are still in your sins. And it was so amazing to see her break down crying because God revealed it to her. And she, she just felt so emotional at that time. And her son Brandon is ready to get his sins forgiven and get baptized as well. Because there's going to be a lot of people that are deceived. That said a sinner's prayer, that said a prayer, and they accepted Jesus in their heart, and, and then later on they went and got baptized, but they don't want to believe that. They don't want to admit that. They want to deny that that actually happened and, and act like they were baptized. And what's going to happen is it's going to be a challenging time. But it's so important to understand that that's what that feast is representing. <clears throat> That's why God wanted us to honor it over and over and over again for a reason. He wanted us to, to honor it over and over and over so we would remember that day. So we want to remember Jesus on the cross. We want to remember his burial, which is what this is talking about. Keep reading. Verse 21. 
Then Moses summoned all the elders in, in, of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animal for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood of the basin, and put some of the blood on the top of both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the house of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the tops and on the side of the door frames and will pass over the doorway and will not permit the destroyer to enter the house and strike you down. So understand, the blood of Christ, when you die with him and you're buried and you're raised again, you have the Holy Spirit. That's the separation between you and the rest of the world. Just like this was the separation. If you didn't have that blood, if Jesus didn't come and see that blood, no matter how much you said a sinner's prayer, no matter how much you believed it, no matter how much you gave and said, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? No matter how much you've done it, no matter how many Sabbath days you've been to, it makes no difference. If you have not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be separated from God at that time. And so it's encouraging because sometimes it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, if you have not 100% know for a fact you've had your sins forgiven. But let's keep reading. Verse 24. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and for your descendants. So who's it for? It's for us and our descendants. Very important, our children and their children's children. Keep reading. Verse 25. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when you, your children ask you, here's the key. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? So when people start to ask you, what does this mean to you? This is the answer. Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. When, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes? When he struck down the Egyptians, the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did what, just what the Lord commanded. So he want to let people know that this is what he passed over us. This is what it represents. At midnight, the Lord struck down the firstborn of Egypt and the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat at the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon. And the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not there was not a house without someone dead. Wow. That's intense, isn't it? Yeah. See, this is the Lord's Passover. He doesn't play. Think about this. People say, Well, Jesus is a loving God. Well, the Lord was a loving God back then too, but he still struck down all the firstborn. You gotta understand, God, the Lord was a loving God in Noah's day, but he still destroyed the entire earth with the exception of eight people. So that same loving Jesus today is going to be the same result. It's just different. It's called the Great Tribulation. So it's so important for, to make sure you've had your sins forgiven. It's so important to make sure you're honoring God and his commandments. And you're going to see that because this is a foreshadow of what's going to happen in the future. So let's keep going, though. So that's the Passover. So we, we now establish uh, the first day of the month is that month. So that month of Passover is the first month. So what does that month look like? Let's, what is it called in Scripture? Let's look at Exodus 13, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Exodus 13, starting in verse 1. It says, The Lord says to Moses, Consecrate me to firstborn male. The first offspring of every woman among the Israelites belonged to me, whether human or animal. Tell Mo uh, then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day that you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. So just so you understand, this happened to be the 15th day of the month. So this is the day after Passover, the 15th day of the month. And that day is actually a Sabbath day also. We don't work on that day. But look what it says, verse 4, it says, Today in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. Very important to understand, the month of Aviv, Aviv means when the barley is Aviv. And Aviv means ripened for the pick. That's what that means. So what we do every year, and in a couple of months, there's people all around the world that are looking at the barley. Because right here in Orange County, they ain't much barley. And there is, I haven't seen any. 
But there's barley somewhere around this world, and the people around this world that are understanding this, that are honoring, are looking for that barley. God still has people today looking to find out when the barley is Aviv. <clears throat> Aviv means it's ripe for the picking. As soon as we see the barley Aviv, the very next new moon is the very first day of our new year. That's how it works. I'm keeping it simple for you. We can do an exhaustive study later. But to keep it simple, so let's keep reading. Verse 4. Today in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of Canaan, Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hevites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. This was called the promised land, which is the same promised land we are going towards. The land he swore to your ancestors to give you, land flowing with milk and honey. You are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days eat bread with made without yeast, on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eating unleavened bread during those seven days, nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you. Nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son. So again, he tells you what to say. On that day, tell your son. I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So what shall we be telling our, our kids? This is what the Lord did for me. See, this is the mindset you have to have. This is what the Lord did for me. In other words, he got rid of your sin. Remember, baptism and this day is representing when Jesus came, his burial. So that is what freed you for your sin. So when people ask me, why do you honor Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread? Because of what the Lord did for me. He freed me from my sin. You can share that. Look what it says, verse, verse 8. On that day, tell your son, I did this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Egypt is considered slavery. This observant for will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that this law of the Lord should be on your lips. Okay, here's the key. Again, this is a sign. God tells us to look for signs, right? To know what to do. So he's telling you that this sign is going to be two places. It's going to be on your hand. In other words, you don't work on that day. It's a feast day. It's a holy day. It's going to be a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead. We, it's, we, we're supposed to remember not to work on that day and remember to honor that day. It's a reminder on our forehead. So you know how it says something's going to be on your hand and on your forehead? Well, what does that mean on your forehead? It means it's a reminder on your forehead, which you remember. Very key. Let's keep reading. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. So that's why we are to Passover at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because it's a reminder on our hand and on our forehead that he brought us out of slavery. And slavery to us is sin. He brought us out of our sin through baptism for forgiveness of sin when he died on the cross. Okay. So it's very important to understand this basic foundation. Let's keep reading. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives, you, gives it to you, he, as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. The firstborn male of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem every lamb of every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Again, you don't have to break anybody's neck. You don't have to go through that. <laughs> However, we do got to give our first born, our first, our first fruit to God, which is our best. Verse 14. In the days to come, when your sons ask, if you notice he keeps telling you what to say, mm -hmm. so he's giving you the words to say right here. When your sons ask, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, when the Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. So you understand? They were supposed to go out to honor the Lord. Remember, if you read this, the whole message, 
God had told him to go out and honor him on the first fruits. On the first fruit. That was the third day. And on that third day is the same day Jesus rose from the dead. And we're supposed to honor the Lord on that day. So Passover is the Sabbath day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Sabbath day. And then we go honor the Lord on the Feast of First Fruit. That's Jesus rising from the dead. And that's what they were supposed to do. But they didn't let him do it. The Pharaoh didn't let them. Let's keep reading. This is why I sacrificed the first male offspring of every womb and redeemed each firstborn son. And look what it says. And it will be a, like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. If you notice, he has a theme here. He gives us signs. And this, the Passover and unleavened bread is a sign. And it's on your hand and on your forehead. Honoring the Lord when he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruit is a sign between our hand and on our forehead. You understand? Very important. So we're supposed to remember it. It's a day to honor the Lord. What if you don't remember it? What if you choose not to remember this sign? That would probably be a bad idea, right? It would be kind of like trying to drive to New York with no street signs. You'd be driving all around into your parish. That's what would happen. You'd drive all around until you ended up in the ocean somewhere. Because you wouldn't know where you're going. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this world right now. People have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. They have no idea why they're honoring pagan so false gods and stuff that out there. They have no idea because they're not honoring God's holy days because it's a sign for his people. And if you consider yourself his people, why wouldn't you honor his signs and want to honor his signs, right? Why wouldn't you want to? See, I have people who say to me, Stephen, why do you have to do that? I don't have to do it. I can choose not to. He gives us free will to choose what we want. I don't have to honor Passover. I don't have to honor any of these feast days. I choose to honor it. Matter of fact, here's a better way to phrase it. I get to honor it. It's a privilege. Amen. Yeah, I get to do it. It's, I, I have the ability. I have an honor to honor the Sabbath day. It's, it's a blessing to me. It's not I have to do it. I want to do it. You understand? There's a difference in heart, isn't it? You see, so that, you need to think about that. You shouldn't ask the question, why do I have to do it? You don't have to. You can choose to disobey God. And you'll suffer the consequences of that. You understand? It's very important to understand this. So um, the month of Aviv, again, is the first month of your year. It's when the barley is ripened. The feast of Passover was when he died on the cross. The feast of unleavened bread <clears throat> is when we take the leaven out of our house. The feast of first fruit is actually when we give our best to God. Actually, when Jesus rose from the dead. So, where does it say in the Bible, here's a little line on your sheet there, where does the Bible say that the sacred signs are going to be on us? Yeah. On our hand, and where? Forehead. On our forehead. Very important. Okay, let's look at um, Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Now, um, it was interesting because God's not a God of disorder. Because if you, if you look at this scripture, I want to show you something. So they started walking from that point on. So from the point they left Egypt to the point they got to this point was about 50 days. Okay? It was about 50 days because right before that was the beginning of the month, which is about two weeks before. So it was about 50 days difference. Okay? Which is about seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths. The Sabbath is seven days. Seven of those equals 49 days. And you add another day. So it's about 50 days. Got that? Okay, so let's look. On the first day of the third month. So now we know when that time is. Which is exactly 60 days. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the same amount of time from the beginning of the year until they walked here in that time. It's, it's the same amount of time period. You understand? It's about 60 days which is 50 days plus about 10 more from the time before Passover. Make sense? Very important to understand that time frame. But it was something that was confusing me because I was thinking, wait a minute, that's, that happened at the beginning of the month. No, it didn't. It started from Passover. So from Passover 
Seven full weeks is actually 49 days. That's a whole other study we'll go over. But it was just confusing to me, and now God cleared it up. But look what it says. One through six. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out for Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and the Israelites camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. This mountain was Mount Sinai, where Moses was going to go up to the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Listen to the key here. Now if you obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Amen. So these are the <clears throat> So these are the words I'm about to speak to you right now. Kind of like Moses spoke to the Israelites. If you keep his covenant, which we're going to go over the covenant right now, if you keep his covenant, then out of the whole world, you will be his treasured possession. You understand? If you keep his covenant. What's the consequence if you don't keep his covenant? You won't be his treasured possession. Very important to understand. Okay? Now remember, this is the Lord speaking. And who's the Lord? Jesus. Same thing. Very important. Okay. So if you fully, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. So there's two parts. You got to obey the Lord and you got to keep his covenant. Two things. Got it? So let's talk about what the covenant is. Let's look over in Exodus 20. Because if you keep reading, it goes through that. This is a covenant. Now, what is a covenant? It's a, a vow. It's a marriage covenant. Like when you get married, you put a ring on, you're married. You have a covenant between you and your wife. It's, like, it's a marriage relationship. Same thing with this covenant. It's a marriage relationship between God and his people. So the people that keep his covenant are part of that marriage relationship. The people that don't are not. Very simple. And he shows you there's the separation of the world and the people that keep his covenant. Got that? Very important. So let's keep reading Exodus 20. I know this may seem basic for some of you, but really it's for you to understand and be able to teach. It's for you to learn it and be able to teach it at the same time. So let's look at it, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. Who spoke the words? God spoke the words. So let's look at what it says. I am the Lord, your God. So now who's the Lord? Jesus. He just had not become flesh yet. So if Jesus is to say that I'm the Lord, your God, and he, God spoke all these words, and Jesus and God are the, and are the same. So we have to understand that fact, because there's a lot of people that don't get that. So that's who spoke these words. And look what it says. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Who brought us out of Egypt? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord brought us out of Egypt, right? So Jesus is who brought them out of Egypt. Make sense? It's very important to understand this principle to be able to teach this. Look what it says, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. <clears throat> for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, pun punishing the children to the sins of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So he's showing you that keeping his commandments is who he loves. Who hate him are the people that don't keep his commandments from his perspective. Very important to understand. If a person chooses not to keep his commandments from his perspective is that you hate him. That's what the Bible just said. 
He knows who loves him because they keep his commandments. <clears throat> Read John 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what the Bible says. So here's the proof of that right here. Let's keep reading. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So how do you misuse the name of God or Jesus? How do you do that? Give me some ways people misuse the name of Jesus today. Saying, saying it in a way that's not reverent. OMG. Say, say it in a way that's not reverent. Like, oh my God. If you say, oh my God, all the time, then guess what? That's not reverent to God. What else? What other ways? Cursing. Cursing in Jesus' name. Right? Or in God's name. You know, God blank. People cursing God's name all the time, right? That's not being reverent to God. That's, he says he will not hold them guiltless if they misuse his name. So should you repent from that? Should you stop doing that? Yes, absolutely. Another way of misusing his name is preaching in the name of Jesus and teaching false doctrine. Teaching something that's not biblical is not using his name properly. You understand? So there's a lot of ways that we are not going to be held guiltless if we continuously misuse his name. So it's very important that we don't do this, that we look at the scripture from our own heart and repent if this is something in our life. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So how do you remember the Sabbath day? How do we do it? Keeping it holy. By keeping it holy, right? So we remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So it's not just remembering the Sabbath day and going to work. That's not remembering the Sabbath day. Remembering the Sabbath day is that we keep the day holy. Amen. Very important. Let's keep reading. Six days you should labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. So this is another very important point. Is that we rest on the seventh day. Now the seventh day was named the Sabbath. See, there's a lot of people that are deceived right now. They think Saturday is a Sabbath or Sunday is a Sabbath or they make up any day they think is a Sabbath. It doesn't matter what day they think is a Sabbath. The Lord said we rest on the seventh day and that's seven days after we spot a new moon. Okay. That's how you judge it. So you see a new moon, which is a new month, and you count to seven and the moon will be a half a moon. And then on the 14th day, it'll be a full moon like it is tonight. Go outside and look. Next week, it'll be a half a moon on the other side, and then it goes back down to a little sliver, and it starts the process all over again. Because remember, in Genesis, he made the sun, moon, and stars for signs and seasons. Very important. Look what it says. Verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, the seventh day... You should not do any work. Neither you shouldn't do any work. No, your son or daughters, you shouldn't do any work. So let's say you're getting a job or you have a job. You shouldn't work on that day. You need to let them know that you're not working on the seventh day. No, your male or female servants. No, your animals. You know, any foreigners residing in your town. In other words, anyone who wants to be with God's people needs to continuously honor the seventh day. Look what it says, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So can you see how the seventh day is the day we rest? Because he made that in Genesis, right? And then he blessed the seventh day and he named it the Sabbath. So there's only one seventh day and it's called the Sabbath. You understand? There's no other day that's called a Sabbath. People say, why? My Sabbath is Friday night to Saturday night. Well, that's not a Sabbath. That's just your day you feel like resting. Yeah, oh, my Sabbath is Saturday. Well, Saturday is not a Sabbath. It's only the seventh day. Happens to be a Saturday this month, but next month is going to be different. Make sense? Yeah. Very important to understand this principle. Verse 12. Honor your father and mother, so that it may, you may live long in the land your, lot is give, your Lord has given you. You shall not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not cover your neighbor's wife or your male or female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
So these are all the Ten Commandments. That is a covenant between God and his people. Of these ten, which one is the longest one he told us to remember? The Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? That's the one that most people forget. The one that was the longest and the one he told us to remember. That's the one people forget. And remember, um, the Passover was a sign going to be on our hand and our forehead, right? All the commandments are a sign also between God and his people. So let's keep reading. Verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance, said to Moses, Speak to yourself, and we will speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that you will fear God and be and will be with you. I'm sorry. Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you. To keep you from sinning. So God gave us these ten commandments. And one of them is that it's also a test. Write that down in your paper. The ten commandments is a test. And it's designed to do two things. One, so that you'll fear God. Mm -hmm. That's the number one reason why you honor the commandments. When I started learning about the commandments and I saw what he did to the Israelites. It scared the heck out of me. And I had a healthy fear of the Lord. So the number one thing about honoring the commandments, when you do that, it'll help you fear the Lord. But it'll also do something else. It'll also keep you from sinning. Because you're observant of the Lord. You're aware of Him. So you'll, it'll keep you from sinning. So it's very important to understand the reason we honor the Sabbath day. Verse 21, the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So those are the feast days. And that's um, the, this is called the Feast of Weeks at this time. When they got there, that was what's called the Feast of Weeks. And it was, like I said, seven Sabbaths after they left Passover. That time when they left Egypt. So let's look at now Exodus 31. Again, I know this might be some basic things for some of you, but you know what this is proving to you? If it, is, if it seems basic to you, you know what this is just telling you? How well God has trained you about the scriptures. See, you should be able to tell this information. You should know these scriptures like the back of your hand. You've heard them so many times. But if it's not comfortable to you, if, if it's not familiar with you, then you need to learn them. These are basic biblical foundations. Verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. Now, this one's not an option for his people. If you notice that, there's certain things that are optional. Now, it is optional. You don't have to honor. But then just don't call him, don't say you're his people. Don't say, I follow the Lord, but I'm not going to honor the Sabbath day. That doesn't make sense from his perspective. So look what it says. It says to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come, so that you may know that I am the Lord that makes you holy. So again, now the Sabbath day. He, he plucked that one out of the middle of the Ten Commandments, and he made that one a sign between him and his people. So honoring God on today. So today we're in on, on a Saturday. Now it happens to be a Saturday this month. But next month it might be on a Monday. And if it happens to be on a Monday, guess what? We don't work on that day. Guess how many other people in the world will be working that day and most and, and the people won't? It's going to be a very small few that won't be working on, on that Sabbath day. But guess what? The rest of the world will. You know why? Just the same reason why the rest of the world was working on the Sabbath day in those days. Because they weren't honoring God's commandments. They weren't on God's calendar. Just like a lot of people today are not on God's calendar. It's the same. See, God has selected you and pulled you out to give you his Sabbath day so you can honor him on his day. And that's what we're doing. So let's keep reading. Verse 14. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. That's the next thing. 
The reason why we honor the Sabbath is not just because we have to, it's because we get to. You understand? Because we want to. It's a blessing. It's an honor to us. Look what it says. Anyone who desecrates it will be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. Now, does that mean he's going to put you to death today? No. He's talking about eternal life over a long period of time. So it's very important to understand this. Let's keep reading. For six days, work is to be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites, how long? Forever. That's what the Bible says. Forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two stone tablets, the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Here's a very important premise to understand. The law that we have to keep is the Sabbath day and the Ten Commandments. That's the law that was put on the, ten, on the stone. Yeah. And then in the, in the New Testament, when God went up to heaven, sent down the Holy Spirit, he put the Ten Commandments on our hearts. Yeah. So it's very important. That's the law that we need to honor. Now, there's other laws and things that God get, puts in provision that we should take care of and do. But these are the ones that are the covenant between God and his people. Very important to understand that. So let's keep going. The next scripture. We're going to read, and now we're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read parts of it. Is Leviticus. This should be a good scripture, a good message for you that are new to this, so you can know where things are. Leviticus 23. These are what's called the appointed festivals. Remember God made the sun, moon, and stars? For appointed times, for sacred assemblies, for the, the uh, appointed feast days. That's what they're called, many different ways to call them. But look what it says in verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals. The appointed festivals of the Lord, which are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. So the key is that everything after this are what's called an appointed time. They are sacred assemblies. They're appointed festivals. Just like people are going to honor an appointed festival for the world this week on the 25th. They call it Christmas. It's not in the Bible, but God tells his people to honor these appointed festivals. And the appointed festivals, the first appointed festival the Lord tells us to honor is what? The Sabbath day. Look what it says. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly. You are to do no work, and you are to not do any work, whether you, wherever you live, it is the Sabbath to the Lord. So no matter what you're doing, no matter where you live, there is no excuse. The moon's always there. You can always find it. There is no more excuse. If you're watching this message right now, and you hear this message, you have no more excuse saying you don't know when the Sabbath day is. If no one sends you a text message, you know when the Sabbath day is. If we don't have a Sabbath for some reason, you know when the Sabbath is. This is between you and the Lord. You understand? That's why God wanted you to hear this message. Because it's not for me to, to, to tell you when the Sabbath is. You need to know it for yourself. Whether if you're with a group or wherever you live, no matter where you are, it's between you and the Lord, just like prayer is between you and the Lord. Very important. Verse 4. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover is the first one he's talking about. We just went through that, so you can read all about that. The next one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's in that verse 6. Verse 9, it starts talking about the Feast of first fruit, which is when Jesus rose from the dead. The Feast of Weeks is the next one, when he went up to the mountain and brought down the Ten Commandments. 
That was the Feast of Weeks. The next feast is called the Feast of Trumpets. The feast after that is called the Day of Atonement, verse 26. And the feast after that is called the Feast of Tabernacles. You can read these for yourself. And I would strongly recommend you to do it. So you can learn them for yourself. But this is very important. The Feast of Trumpets is when the Lord began to start to gather his people and take them into the promised land. See, they were supposed to go into the promised land those days. So he gave them Passover. He fulfilled Passover back then. And he killed, you know, killed the firstborn. He led them out of Egypt. He fulfilled that one back then. He um, led them to the first fruit where they gave the first fruit to God. That, he fulfilled that feast. He went up to the mountain, sent down the Ten Commandments. He fulfilled that feast on the exact same day. What was supposed to happen next, they were supposed to be going to the promised land. And that feast was called the Feast of Trumpets. We're just going to read just a small bit of that. Because it's so important to understand this feast day. Because the Lord just fulfilled this feast day in our day. And you need to understand that. And more importantly, you need to believe it. Because up to this point, this feast had not been for feast, had not been fulfilled for feast. <laughs> that feast had not been fulfilled. The Feast of Trumpets, because they never went into the Promised Land. So God gave 4,000 years between that point and this point, and that feast had never been fulfilled. It wasn't fulfilled when Jesus came the first time, and it wasn't fulfilled up until now. But on that last year, God fulfilled this feast. Let's read it. The Lord said to Moses, make two trumpets out of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and having the camp set out. Write that down. The Feast of Trumpets was designed for two things. When he called the, he called the community together and he set them out. That's what he did. He went them to set out. Now, when he fulfilled it in our days, what he did was he called the community together. Last, on the Feast of Trumpets this year, this year's Feast of Trumpets happened to land on September 11th. And God showed us that this was the exact same day because I did a history study. And God showed that the exact same day back then when they were supposed to go into the Promised Land, but they were afraid to go in because there were giants in the land, was exactly the same day. It was September 11th. We, the God showed it through the barley uh, ripening and, and the, 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 vibe, the, the grape ripens that day. And there were some other studies that we did and God revealed it. That on the exact same day, 4,000 years later, God fulfilled this feast day. Because we had over 5,000 people that we had gotten and gathered together started to honor the Lord on his holy day. So God fulfilled that feast day and you have to believe that. Just like, you got to understand, the reason why this is hard for some people to grasp, because we're the ones who lived it. But you got to understand, in the days of Jesus, when he was alive, the only people that knew Jesus rose were the people that were there. The people in Egypt didn't know. The people in other places didn't know. The people in Africa and Ethiopia didn't know. The Ethiopian eunuch came by and they were like, well, what's going on here? And he came and told them what happened with Jesus. And guess what he said? Why should I be baptized? And he was baptized. See, there was a lot of people that weren't there when that, day, that feast day was fulfilled. But the people that were there knew it was fulfilled. They believed it. And you who are here on the Feast of Trumpets last year, who were honoring the Feast of Trumpets last year, that watched God take a little bit of money and spread it all around Egypt and Africa and, 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 Israel, and uh, India and all those different places around the country and took that message all around this world, he gathered his people, and he's probably still gathering his people right now. He gathered the people. So you got to believe, just like they believed, that that's what happened. Because what if they had doubted that Jesus rose from the dead? They wouldn't know the signs of the times. And the same thing, you have to know that Jesus fulfilled that feast day this year on the Feast of Trumpets. Because he did and then what ended up happening, let's keep reading. Verse 5, actually verse 4. If only one is sounded, 
the leaders, the head of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sound of the second blast, the camps of the south are to set out. The blast will be a signal for setting out. What is a signal? A sign. You understand? It's another marker. So the trumpet is a sign that we need to be aware of for setting out. And to gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the signal for setting out. So there are two different trumpets. The sons of Aaron and the priests are blowing the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for generations to come. When you go into battle against your enemy who is oppressing you, sound the trumpet, sound the blast of the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord and rescued from your enemies. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what's happening. God is rescuing us from his, our enemies right now. Look what it says, verse 10. Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and your new moon feasts. The only feast day that lands on the new moon feast and is an appointed festival is the Feast of Trumpets. And that was on September 11th this year. And we know how significant that day is, September 11th. Because what happened 17 years before. Let's keep reading. You are to sound the trumpet over the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. And they will be a memorial for you, your God. I am the Lord, your God. Very important to understand. You understand? This is an important thing for you to know as God's people. God fulfilled the Feast of Trumpets on September 11, 2018. I know that's a bold statement, isn't it? But I guess what? It's about as bold as when they said Jesus rose from the dead. Which one's more bold? Yeah, so do you believe Jesus rose from the dead on the day that the scriptures say? Then you better believe that Jesus fulfilled his feast day on the Feast of Trumpets because for the last eight years, my wife and my family and our ministry has been focused on the Feast of Trumpets for eight straight years. And this year, God took that now and showed us that we're not even going to have to think about it anymore because it's been fulfilled. We're still honoring it, but now we're focused on the Feast of Tabernacles. You understand? And up to this point, we couldn't even think about the Feast of Tabernacles. We were focused on the Feast of Trumpets because the Lord knew that was the next feast that needed to be fulfilled. So you better believe it. That's a sign between God and his people. Let's keep reading. So what are some of the feasts and the signs of today? So we're going to do other messages on this. This is the first. But there are other signs. Because we need to know the signs of the times. God wanted you to have a foundation of where all this came from. But now let's look at Mark. Mark 13. Mark 13 talks about the signs of today. The destruction of the temple and the signs of the end times. Did you know that in Israel, the land they call Israel today, the people that call themselves Jews along with the United States and some other places are starting to build what's called a third temple in, Jer in Jerusalem right now. It's, the ground's being broken. It's being built right now. You don't have to believe me. You can go on Google. You can go on YouTube and look and see it being done right now. Why? Because they believe it's the end times. They believe the Messiah is coming, so they're building this third temple. You see, there were two temples built in the back then, right? And they were built with hands. They were built with stone. But what does the Bible say the last temple is going to be built with? It's going to be built without hands and without stones. You won't see it with your careful observation. That's what it says. As a matter of fact, he said the temple of God is within you. When you get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you become the body. The body becomes the temple of the living God. We are the third temple, and it is being built up. It's being built up right here, right now. Saved by Truth Ministry is part of the Church of Philadelphia. And the temple of God is being built right here, right now. And you can't see it with your careful observation. It doesn't come like that. It's not going to be built over there in Israel because spiritual Israel is the people of God. We are Israel. It's not a land called Israel. 
We are the people of Israel. The true Israelites of the Bible and the people that are grafted in are Israel today. And it is being built up again. It's just not going to be over there like they think it is. You got to understand this is deception and God's revealing his times. But if you don't know the signs, you're not going to know what to look for. So here's, let's keep reading. Verse 13, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what a magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Jesus replied, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, John, John, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the signs that they are all to be about to be fulfilled? Isn't that an interesting question? What are the signs? So he tells them, the, what are the signs? So what are the signals? What are the markers? What are the street signs so we can navigate through this mess so we can know what to look for, right? Isn't that what signs are for? We just established that. So what are the signs that they're all about to be fulfilled? Isn't that the question we're asking? Don't we want to know when Jesus is going to come back? Yeah, yeah we want to know. So guess what we need to know? What do we need to know? That's right, what the signs are. And if you're not observant of the sign, if you want to put your head in the sand and act like there's no signs, then you're going to be left behind. You're going to not know the signs. You understand? God wants you to know the signs. That's why he put them there. He didn't put street signs out here for nothing. We don't put signs on our car for nothing. We don't put logos for nothing. We put them for a reason so we'll know whose it is. Right? And God gives us signs. And our sign is on our hand and our forehead, honoring the Sabbath day, honoring the Passover, honoring the feast days, honoring his holy days, honoring his new moon celebration, honoring his month of Aviv. Those are signs of God's people. Guess what the opposite of that is? Signs of the world, the ones that don't honor them. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. That is the number one sign that God tells us to look out for. That's the first sign. It's kind of like ingredients on a ketchup bottle. The number one ingredient in the bottle is always put at the top. And then it goes to the things that are less important in the ingredients, right? Those not necessarily important, but the less quantity of it. But the number one sign that Jesus says to look out for is that no one deceives you. Because many are going to come in Jesus' name, claiming that Jesus is the Messiah, and they are going to deceive many. Those are called pastors. Those are called presidents. Those are called people of God. Those are called people that say they love the Lord. Those are called, called your family that want to, want to save you from your, yourself. Those are called people that are going to talk in Jesus' name, but they're going to teach you false doctrines. They're going to say, you don't have to honor that Sabbath day. God's not going to do anything to you. You don't have to honor those feast days. Those are pagan. We should honor Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, and all those pagan holidays. That's okay, because God doesn't care. See, that's the people that's going to say those things. They're coming in Jesus' name, and they're going to deceive many. You understand? That's the number one sign to look out for. Verse 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of war, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen. Nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes and in, in, in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. So I don't know if you've ever looked online, but I strongly recommend looking on there for some of you. Go on YouTube and start learning. Um, Jason A. has videos and there's a lot of other great videos out there of all the signs that are happening right now. Most people don't know because you're protected. See, when the Israelites were in Goshen, just so you guys understand, when the Israelites were in Goshen, which is the place that was right in Egypt where the Israelites lived, what they didn't know what was happening to the Egyptians. <laughs> That's what you don't realize. They didn't realize that there were frogs over there. They didn't realize there were flies over there. They didn't realize that the locusts had eaten all the food. They didn't know that. They didn't know that there was hailstorms beating down the whole land. They didn't know that. They didn't have any idea that it was black over there all night. They didn't know all the cattle had died. They didn't know nothing. You know why? Because their cattle was walking around like no problem. 
Because there was no flies. It was nice and breezy and comfortable in the area. You know why? Because God protects his people. And just like you right now, God doesn't want you to be deceived because what's happening right now in the world is at a level that you can't imagine. The fires around the California and around this earth has been at an all-time high by far. The amount of earthquakes is the worst in history, in, in any time in history. The, the amount of hurricanes and volcanoes right now that are erupting right now as we speak are at an all-time high. The amount of famine that's going around the world of places that don't have food, don't have money, is at an unbelievable level. At the highest levels in history that has ever existed from the beginning of the world. You got to understand, there's more disease, more crime, more, um, more hatred of God, more, more getting God's name out of, the, by, out of the world than at any time in the history of the world. But see, you should be grateful. You know why? Because you've been protected. I'm not going to tell you again. You gotta, you've been protected. You've been protected by God. But don't be deceived thinking that it's not happening. You need to understand. You need to see the signs of the times. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. You must be on guard. You see, God tells you right there. You must be on guard. You will be handed over to the local council and flogged in the synagogues. And there are brothers and sisters right now being challenged right now the, around the world. Look what it says. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings and, as witnesses to them. And the gospel must, be, must first be preached to all nations. This is the key. This is where we come into play. The good news of the kingdom of heaven, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, this message about the Sabbath day and then the feast days must be preached around the world. And I believe God's about to do something unbelievable in our ministry with, with some th things that's happened in our business and some things that's happening through you that no one's ever seen in this world before. God's about to do some things amazing right now because the word of God has to be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just, that, just say whatever is given to you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father and child. Children will rebel against their parents, and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And that's the key, you guys. The ones who stand firm to the end will be saved. Not the ones who shrink back and quit, or the ones that go back to their life. The ones that stand firm to the end are the ones that's going to be saved. Verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go to enter the house and take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get the cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that it will not take place in winter, because those days will be distressed and equal from the beginning when the, God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Wow. Wow. Isn't that awesome? See, the Lord cut short these days. It's not going to go to fruition. It's not going to be this end of the world scenario. Because God's going to cut them short. And here's why. For the sake of the elect. Guess who are the sake of the elect? The Church of Philadelphia. The Bride of Christ. Read about the Church of Philadelphia in the book of Revelation. There's seven churches. Only one doesn't go through the Great Tribulation. Doesn't go and suffer the wrath of God. And that's the Church of Philadelphia. And we believe we are the Church of Philadelphia. And our message is going around this world right now as we speak. So look what it says. Verse 21. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, there's the Messiah, or there he is, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. 
So do you think it's important to be on your guard? Well, when God says it two times in one passage, to be on your guard, then you should be on your guard. In other words, you, your eyes need to be open. You need to be awake and alert and sober so you can know what's going to happen. Because he told us ahead of time. Look what it says. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give us light. And the stars will fall from the sky. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. See, some of his elect will be here left on earth. And some of his elect will be in heaven. That's called the bride of Christ. You got to understand, this happens after the great tribulation, when the mark of the beast is being implemented, which is being implemented right now as we speak. In India and in different parts in Sweden, people are getting this chip. That is not the mark of the beast. That's what's going to control the money. You got to understand, the blockchain is the key to the whole deal, you guys. The blockchain. Just listen out for the blockchain. That's the key. You got to understand, he's going to send his angels to gather his elect from the ends of the earth, the people that are left behind, and the people that are in heaven, the bride of Christ. Then he's going to bring them together back down on earth, and we're going to reign for a thousand years. That's how it goes down. Verse 28. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and the leaves come out, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happen, you know that it is near right at the door. You got to understand how near it is. It's right at the door. When do you go to see if your friends are here? When they're at the door. See, not when they're in the car, not when they're driving on the way. You know, when they get at the door and they ring the doorbell, that's when you know they're here, right? All you have to do is go and open the door and be ready for them. And the same thing, when we see all these things, which we can see them all now, we can see them all happening now, every one of them. We'll do a lesson on all the signs. Today was just an overview of the signs. We're going to do more lessons over the next few weeks on the signs. But look what it says, truly I tell you, verse 30, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Earth, the heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. How many times does it need to say be on guard, be alert? In one passage, in one passage of scripture, he said it three separate times. Be on guard and be alert. In other words, don't be sleeping at this time. Don't be just going to work and putting your head down and playing the ostrich approach to life. you got to be alert. You should be looking at this stuff for yourself. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of because you're protected. But you've got to be alert. you got to be aware of this information. God's not sharing this to discourage you. He's sharing this because he's coming to get you. He wants you to be alert and be aware. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away, he leaves his house and puts the servant in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. If you notice, he tells us to now watch. See, he's not even telling us just to be alert, he's telling us to watch with our eyes. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. So you got to understand, he's going to come one day, and we know he's going to come on a feast day. And we believe he's going to come on the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because the Feast of Trumpets has already been fulfilled. The Day of Atonement has already been fulfilled. We fulfilled that feast this year, when the entire body of Christ were praying for the entire world, just like the Bible says we should. And then this feast, we believe, could come on the Feast of Tabernacles. Look what it says. Verse 36, if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So what do you think the Lord wants us to do? Watch. Watch. Be awake. Be sober. Keep our eyes open. Look for the signs of the times. Learn them. 
be obedient to his covenant and his commandments, and you will be protected. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this day, Father. Thank you so much for this message. It's just such a powerful message, God, for us to understand um, all your signs, all your signs of the times, and you give us these signs so you can direct us in life. You can give us the fear of the Lord as a test. You can allow us to, to allow us to obey you so we can stop sinning, Father. You give us this co our covenant so we can be right with you when you come to get us. Father, we are so waiting and so eager with bated breath, Father. And we pray that this year you can bless our ministry, you can bless our families, you can bless the brothers and sisters in, in, in India right now that are struggling because it's so cold there, they don't even have jackets, Father. But I pray that you can bless our ministry that we can give to them and serve those needs, Father. Father, I pray that you protect our ministry from the least to the greatest of all of us. Father, so that we can be uh, ready when you come to meet us um, and we can go meet you in the air. We thank you so much for this time. We pray everyone has a great Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.